Hello, welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic, where um, after a lot of computer problems today, I've actually, I think, managed to record a couple of videos. Well, I've, I've done one, um, which was the crossword video, which hopefully will be up for those of you who enjoy the crosswords. And I'm going to try this one, which is, I'm hoping, going to be a Sudoku video, although I say that with some trepidation as um, Pranaya, I think it's pronounced, who sent this in, says that their um, computer solver says that this puzzle is unsolvable. And this is a puzzle, it looks like it's from an app, um, one of these sudoku.com apps, um, and uh, the puzzle was released in March. So it's, it's, a little, uh, it's a little older than sort of today or yesterday. But um, anyway, I'm going to try and solve it. Um, I'm hoping that the, that the computer solver is wrong. Now, on the basis that it's likely to be a very hard puzzle, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my normal technique for very hard puzzles. I'm going to start off with Snyder notation. So in three by three blocks, if I limit a number to exactly two positions, so a good example would be the nine on the, in this block, can only be in this cell and this cell and I'll make little pencil marks to remind myself of that and then at some point during the solve I anticipate I'm going to have to switch and fully notate cells in order to try and spot some of the more exotic logics normally associated with extremely difficult puzzles so I'll try and judge that uh, as well as I can um, but we'll have to see now we have a five a five this cell here is going to have to be a five let's start there um, now that means we need one and two to complete this block well we can do that as well so let's put all that in and start making use of the pencil marks that we get from this seven seven sevens down here five up here that means this must be a five and this must be a five and this must be a five okay so we've done very well with fives so far um, Okay, let's see where we can go next. So I can see that we can pencil mark threes at the top. Just a quick note as well to say thank you to all of those of you who've become, become patrons of Cracking the Cryptic since yesterday. Um, we should be sending out your puzzle, um, which is a, a between one and nine puzzle that Mark's created very shortly. So look out for that. Nines can be pencil marked there. Um, two, four, eight. I'm just looking now for hidden or naked singles along the rows and columns where we have a lot of given numbers. Not seeing anything there immediately. Fours, threes. Okay, let's try up here, two, four, and eight up here. So, ah, here's a four. Okay, there is a hidden single there. So you can see if we compare the contents of row three with the contents of column nine, the only number that actually can go in this square is a four. That means we get to pencil mark fours into those two squares because of this four and this four. And that's going to be very useful because now we are able to place a four here. And the moment I do that, I eliminate one of the nines positions. So this now will have to be a nine and this will have to be a seven. One of the great advantages of this pencil mark notation there. So now nine here, nine here, this square has got to be a nine. Which allows us to pencil mark nines into those two positions. Seven nines into these two squares which eliminates this this nine this is going to have to be the nine on this side apologies if you can hear children being told off um, this is a, a hazard of uh, i'm going to have to call this sorry okay sorry about that i had to go and um, help um, so we're back on this now I'll, I'll fill in these two numbers now. So that's three and six. The options there. So oh, that resolves this three up here. That must now be here. That gives us a seven, two. Seven, seven, pencil mark the sevens at the top. Um, this must be a one, obviously, just to complete the column. It's amazing how when you're solving on a computer and trying to speak to a video, 
how often I don't see just completely, you know, numbers that complete columns and rows. Um, so two and eight to complete this column. Certainly once I switch to full notation, I will definitely be highlighting that, but I think we'll hold off on that just for a minute. Nine, it's nine here, nine here. So there's a nine um, in one of these two positions. That resolves this. This now must be the nine. Nine, nine. Six here, and this six here. That's nice. That gives me a six nine pair in this block, which means this is a six. Um, <coughs> so, what can we do with that? This seven now operates on that block as well. Seven in one of those two squares. Two, uh, one, uh, sorry, no, two, seven, eight along here. Two, eight, ah, seven, seven. This is this is the only position a seven can go in row six, look, because we have a seven stopping a seven in that position. This seven stops a seven there. So in fact, that is a seven. That means we've got two and eight into these two cells. Um, almost can do something with these sixes. Look, in fact, I can pencil mark the two and the eight in this three by three block because they're the only two positions that the two and eight can go into. So this is a six or a nine. Uh, okay. One, two, three, eight down here. Uh, so three and ah, oh, hang on, look, three, six, and eight along this row. I think is that right? Three, six, and eight along, which means this square here can only be an eight because we already have a three and a six in a column. So I think this is an eight, and that this eight here allows me to pencil mark eights into those two squares, which gives. That's more pencil marked eights in this block. Um, this must be a three or a six. There's a six up here. So in fact, this is a three. This is a three. This is a six. Certainly so far, this must be a three here because it's the only place a three can go in the three by three block. So far, so good. Um, obviously, these things can have horrible stings in the tail, but it's been pretty useful so far. I'm going to check this column because of the eight in it. We talked yesterday about the importance when we're picking rows and columns to check, we should always pick rows and columns that have a few numbers in and rare numbers as well. So one, two, four, and seven. So this is a one or a two. Um, no, we can't quite do anything with that. Seven, seven. Five, five, we've done all the fives, need to remember not to look at those anymore. We can pencil mark eights down here into those two squares because of the eights in those two positions. And we're looking at one, two, and eight. So we can, again, we can pencil mark the ones into these two squares here. Twos, eights, like that. Um, sort of feels to me like we ought to be able to go further with the nines and the sixes because we've got so many of them. Six, six, nine, nine. Ah, yeah, okay. We can. We can use uniqueness, can't we? Because this six here, if we look at the positions a six can go in this bottom three by three, there are those positions, but these two positions here are invalid. And that's because if we look at this three by three block, we have a six and a nine in, a, in exactly the same positions in the columns. So let's just ask ourselves, let's imagine that in the finished grid, we looked at the solution and there was a six in this square. 
Well, that would imply that this was a 6, this was a 9, and this was a 9. Now, the issue with that arrangement of 6s and 9s is that these 6s and 9s in this pattern exist outside the whole of the rest of the, of the Sudoku because there's no way of disambiguating between that arrangement of 6 and 9 and an arrangement where the 6 is here. All that happens if the 6 is here instead is we get 6, 6, 9, 9. So the 6s and the 9s flip round, but nothing else changes in the whole of the rest of the puzzle because in each 3x3 three three block, we still have the 6 and 9 fixed. In each column, the 6s and the 9s have just flipped round. In each row, we still have the two 6s and 9s. So the problem with a Sudoku of that nature is it has two solutions. We know that good Sudokus don't have two solutions and therefore we can use that restriction in our solving. This has to be a 6, which immediately allows us to do that, which is probably going to be quite powerful. Um, one's here, two's here. This must be 2 and 9 now in this order. That resolves the 9 and the 6. That resolves the 2 and the 8. And we're starting to really get towards a finish now. Um, so we need 4 and 6 along here. Ah, this 6 here resolves that. Oh, it would do it. I could press the right mouse button. 6 and 4. Okay, so I'm tempted now to use this moment to switch. And the, the reason I want to switch is there's a lot going on here um, in terms of the number of pairs we're immediately going to be able to deduce. So if we just do this quickly, you can see we have 2 and 8 into those two positions, 2 and 4 into these two positions, um, this square here can only be a 4 and 8. 2, 8. Okay, and that's enough. In fact, there's loads going on here. Um, yeah, there's loads going on here. So, let's talk about this. Um, I can see two ways of making progress from here, and they're related to one another, but they're probably only tangentially related in this puzzle. So you'll have heard me in recent videos talking about the importance, especially when you're getting towards the finishing stages of a Sudoku, a difficult Sudoku puzzle, in identifying rows and columns where numbers can only go in exactly two positions. Now here, we have the opportunity to look at exactly that situation because in row 5 the 2 is limited to exactly these two positions. But this 3x3 three three block we've not placed a 2 in it yet. So this is classic empty rectangle territory. We know that the 2 will be either in row 1 in one of these three positions or it will be in column 5 in one of these three positions. And you can see that has a profound effect on this square. Obviously if the 2 was in one of those three positions this square would have to be a 1. That's obvious. But if it's in the column, if it's, if it's in one of these three positions, I mean you'll immediately see it. Can only, let's imagine it was here, that's going to be the simplest. Then this square here can't be a 2, and this will have to be a 2. And that will mean this can't be a 2. So either way around, whether there's a 2 here, oops, or a 2 in the column, this square here can never be a 2. Now, the other way I can see of, of looking at this, this, the importance of these 2s in row 5 is because Let's take a look at row 1. Now you can see in row 1 we have a 2 in this square, which marries up obviously uh, column 8 with this, this 2 in this position, and we don't yet know where the 2 is going in this block. But this arrangement of 2s is a finned x-wing. What do I mean by that? Well, if for example 
um, let's ignore the fins. Let's imagine that this was this. These were the only positions in rows one and rows five that twos could go into. So let's just study this and ask ourselves what what this means about the puzzle. What this would mean is that in the finished grid, either this would be a two and this would be a two, or this would be a two and this would be a two. But in either situation, we've got a, we've already fixed our twos, or we know that there is a two in column five and column eight in either this position or this position. There can't be any other twos. This square cannot be a two. It's impossible. This would have to be an eight. So if we can reduce the puzzle to a simple X-wing arrangement, we've cracked it. We can't have a two here. Now you may say, ah, but we've got a problem because we've got these fins on the X-wing. We haven't managed to rule out a two from either this square or this square, so we can't know that the X-wing is true. And the beauty of the finned X-wing is that we don't need to know it's true. Because let's look at the, um, the, the two sort of logical scenarios that can exist as regards this puzzle. Either the X-wing is true, that's one possibility, and we know that if the X-wing is true, I get to delete this two from this square, or it's not true. But if it's not true, then we know that one of the fins is gonna eliminate this two from this square. So what does all that mean? Well, what it means is that we have a choice about how to proceed. We either know because of the empty rectangle that we can eliminate the two from this square, or we know because of the finned X-wing, we can eliminate the two from this square. So let's use the empty rectangle and just see where that takes us. So this is gonna be a one, this will be an eight, this will be a one, this will be four, two, eight, two, one, two, four, um, two, eight, um, now where are we going now? I guess let's have a look along here. We need to place one, seven, and eight. So this is going to be seven, eight, one, like that. This now must be a seven. We still need to place a two. And if everything's worked out okay, we're going to find there's a four in this square. And that's how to do this supposedly unsolvable puzzle. It certainly wasn't unsolvable. It had a very nice last step, actually, a good, good way of learning about these different sort of exotic techniques to crack the puzzle. I'm very surprised the solver couldn't solve it. Um, I think most decent computer solvers certainly cover those techniques. Um, but that doesn't matter. We still got some value out of it. So I hope you enjoyed that. Do subscribe to the channel if you do. If you want to um, see Cracking the Cryptic's own puzzles, then um, it's $2 uh, on Patreon. Um, to, to get access to those and three dollars if three dollars on patreon you get a video explaining how to do the cracking cryptic puzzle so we're looking forward to showing you that and we're back soon with another edition of cracking the cryptic